for joining me for this series of Tune Into Tourism that's all focused on sustainability. Now, of course, sustainable tourism means more than just protecting the environment. Communities are the lifeblood of what makes our industry great. And empowering them and enabling them to choose the type of tourism they want for the future is an essential part of sustainable tourism. My guest today is David Bryan, Head of Sustainable Business at the Social Enterprise Academy. And I started off by asking him a little bit more about what he does. So the Social Enterprise Academy has been around for 17 years now. And our role is to support people all over the world who are trying to make the world a better place. They're trying to work towards social goals, environmental goals. And the one thing they've got in common is they take an enterprising approach just to do that. So they're running businesses whose primary purpose is to change the world for the better. Our role is to support them through um, enhancing their leadership skills, their enterprise skills through connecting them um, and really to help them to do more of the great work that they do. That sounds great and it very much feeds into what our, um, our theme is for this whole series and that is around sustainability and of course communities play such an important part of that. We do tend to think of the environment first uh, when we talk about sustainable tourism but of course uh, communities and protecting our communities for the future are, are, is a key pillar of, of what sustainable tourism is all about, isn't it? That's right. And communities for the first time have been recognised in the government's tourism strategy. Actually, too much communities are the tourism product it's the reason that people travel to remote rural areas very often is to engage with a different way of life a different culture culture's how we make sense of the world around us and and we we it's reflected in in things like food and drink in in music in architecture even in landscape through land management practices so actually communities you know inform culture and that, that shapes the world, shapes the place that visitors are coming to see. So it's really important that we um, protect and enhance communities through tourism because it is the product. It is what, community, what visitors are you know, coming to see. Yeah, and it absolutely is a partnership, isn't it, um, between you know, the visitor and the communities. They both can work together uh, for their mutual benefit. And, and obviously businesses, tourism businesses within a community can also collaborate together to create a more sustainable product, which uh, can enhance what everyone's doing uh, and create a, a more secure future. Tell us about some of the things that you've done um, within, within communities with tourism businesses specifically. Yeah, we've been working with Hands and Hands Enterprise and South of Scotland Enterprise to support community organisations that are um, that, that are that are busy, um, you know, improving the tourism product. They're delivering um, elements of the tourism product that might be uh, bunkhouses or hostels, or it might be a marina or a, um, a museum or um, some other visitor attraction. And, um, and, and, and our role is to enable the people who are running these community-led social enterprises to really step up, um, definitely to run their, their own social enterprises you know, more sustainably, enable them to grow, have an en en enhanced sustainable impact. But also we're, we're really encouraging those, those uh, leaders to step up as, as leaders for the tourism sector and, and ensure that the voice of communities is heard not just in terms of you know, recipients of, of the benefits of tourism, but actually is uh, sharing the, the voice, and voice and the vision, the, the dreams, really the hopes and the dreams of communities. Um, so yeah, our, our role is, is, is trying to uh, create a new, new generation of leaders for tourism from the communities themselves. Yeah, so they're working towards a future where they're attracting the visitors they want to attract and, uh, and offering an experience that, that actually complements um, that community and what they have to offer. Tell me about, you, you talked about working on sus more sustainable practices um, within tourism in a community. What sort of things are we talking about? It's about helping communities to first of all think, what do they want out of tourism? What is it, how do they want their community to develop? You know, is it, is it better housing? Is it more opportunities um, for, for the young people? Is it about more, more businesses? Uh, you know, what is it that they're trying to achieve? And the funny thing is that, that communities all over the world are asking themselves the same question. What do we want? How do we want our communities to develop? And then they're asking themselves, what sort of tourism is going to deliver that change? And literally, we've, we've, we were a, we're a global social enterprise. We work with communities all over the world. And Exactly the same questions are being asked by communities. 
course, the answers might be different. If it's, you know, if it's in the foothills of the Himalayas, it might be electric power. If it's a native North American people, then it might be protecting the language. So it's going to be different in Scotland. Of course it is. But I think it's, um, it, it's really interesting and really exciting that communities are starting to think, well, what sort of tourism do we want? Increasingly, tourism is about creating authentic visitor experiences. And if we're going to do that, if we're going to enable visitors to truly become temporary locals, to feel like they're part of a community, to have an authentic experience, then the whole community has got to be on board with it. And the whole community will be on board with it if they can see that it's, um, it's, it's producing the sort of outcomes that they want for their community. And you talked about how those priorities might be different in different places. From your experience, what are the priorities for businesses in the Highlands and Islands, or communities, I should say, in the Highlands and Islands? Well, I think everywhere is different, first of all. Um, this, this, this concept of place, you know, sense of place, it recognises that what we've known in the Highlands for a long time is that everywhere is different. Every individual village has got its, its different economy, um, different social issues, and different um, environmental challenges, as well as business opportunities. So I think it's wrong to generalise. I think it's really important that communities themselves, you know, decide what it is that they, that they want out of tourism and how they want their communities to, to grow. But clearly, it's about things like opportunities. It's about opportunities for their young people to be able to, to, to carve out a job for themselves, to be able to afford um, a house, to be able to bring up their children in a safe and, and welcoming environment. So that might be about jobs, um, really good quality jobs um, for, for young people as they leave school or perhaps after they've been to university to come back to be able to um, access a professional job or start a business, start a social enterprise. Um, it, it's absolutely about that. But, but everywhere is different. And, and obviously, as I say, a lot of communities are really interested in, in trying to do something to, to share their culture, to share their their environment, it might be the natural environment that they want to share, to, um, you know, to, to, to share their sense of, uh, of how they understand the world. And, um, uh, and that might be through something like a, um, an arts festival or, a, you know, a heritage museum or something like that. So um, I don't think there's any one answer, but I think it's really important that communities themselves get to decide what they want um, out of tourism, what the fruits of tourism should be for them. Well, one example um, of uh, a community that you've worked with and who've had great success, I would say, in um, <clears throat> so far anyway, has been the Loch Ness Hub. And we've actually, we went up to see what they've been up to. Uh, so let's take a look at that case study now. Loch Ness Hub is essentially the face of the village here in Drumadrocket and wider Glenuckert area. Tourism for this community is immensely important. You, you only have to drive around to see the number of businesses that are involved in tourism and support tourism and deal with visitors through the, the summer, whether it's hotels, bed and breakfasts, restaurants. Loads of the community are invested in tourism. Losing the visitor information centre is going to leave a hole in the centre of the village and the community really didn't want that to happen so we undertook a community asset transfer to buy the building from Highland Council. We then sought funding to enable us to um, establish a sustainable social uh, enterprise and then finally this year we were able to refurbish the building and launch Loch Ness Hub and open it to the, the public. Obviously we're on the shores of Loch Ness, but we are the first thing that people see when they come to the village because we're right in the centre of the car park. Having a completely refurbished building, completely refurbished toilets, we are presenting something that the community is not only proud of, but visitors walk away with a fantastic experience of the area. For us, we knew from the outset that it wasn't enough just to own the building. We had to have something sustainable that would allow us to operate it develop the hub into the future and the aspiration was to deliver community benefit to the, the wider area as well. Benefits for the community, we have a refurbished building which everybody locally now refers to as the hub. We've also been able to engage with the wider community and we've established for example a craft trail so the um, 
visitors are able to walk around the village and visit some of the workshops and uh, some of the artists and, and people that, that work locally whose goods are uh, on sale in the, 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 the hub. Um, so that's provided some benefit to the community. And we rent the building from the Development Trust. So we are also paying rent back into the community and the Development Trust are able to use that money to support other local projects. The community share offer was a fantastic success. We were very much proud as not only the Loch Ness Hub but an entire community. Part of the remit of the share offer was that 75% of the total shareholders, so the number of shareholders, not the shares, had to come within the local community here. So for a small community of approximately 2,500 people and raising 110,000 over the course of four weeks was just a fantastic achievement and um, credit to the community for, for getting behind the project. There was a huge marketing campaign that went behind it on social media um, as well as websites but everyone within the community, including the local businesses, got behind that and invested. It was a long journey from the initial public meeting where people said they wanted to have a, a facility like this to actually realising it and launching it. And to be successful, we had to engage with other stakeholders and other organisations. We found um, the Development Trust Association Scotland and the community ownership support service that they provide. That was particularly helpful at the outset when we were trying to buy the building. Um, we also had support from Enterprise Accelerator, which was a, a, a support in terms of the development of our, our business plan, so that was useful. Um, and latterly, we've had support from Highlands and Islands Enterprise, which has been useful in refurbishing the building. For us, the business that underpins the hub and makes us sustainable is a baggage transfer business. So we move bags up the Great Glen Way for walkers who are, are doing that long distance trail, moving their bags from one bed and breakfast to a hotel to a bed and breakfast. So it's a good revenue generating business that allows us to employ staff to deliver visitor information and to operate a community transport hub. So we're promoting active travel. You'll see that we've got a, a fleet of e-bikes and those are available both for local people and visitors to use. The e-bikes are a fantastic asset to the Loch Ness Hub. They allow people to reach areas of the Glen here that they would never normally reach. Because they are power assisted and we live in a very hilly area, it allows them to uh, climb hills and that applies to people of all abilities. We do hire them out to people from 14 years and up and that can, we've had 70, 80 year olds out on the e-bikes and absolutely love them. So a huge part of Loch Ness Hub is also being a transport hub. We've worked very closely with one of our partners here in the community in the shape of Sorovus. Sorovus are a local enterprise company that distribute funds from renewable energy projects within the area. They also help us with items like the air source heat pump and our solar panels that we have here on the building. Again, that hugely helps with our sustainability. Infrastructure in the Highlands for the many people that are coming in motorhomes <laughs> is extremely limited and we found that the installation of a, a motorhome facility has been a, a, a real a benefit to this community. We no longer suffer from people disposing of waste inappropriately around the um, local area and it's been well received by people who use motorhomes. They're, they're really pleased to come and find a facility that enables them to empty their waste and, and do all the things that they need to do. So when people come into the Loch Ness Hub, the first thing they might be looking for is a ticket for Uckert Castle. We've been working very closely with Historic Environment Scotland this year and become an agent for the castle, for Uckert Castle tickets, because if you imagine half a million people going to a very small car park, sometimes the tendency wasn't previously, they would move on, whereas now the castle can send them back here. We can sell them a ticket and then tell them everything else that's going on. And again, encouraging that slow and responsible tourism. We're trying to create something a little bit different here because part of the ethos was that we wouldn't compete with some of the local businesses already in place. So we're quite an eclectic mix in our range of goods that are available to the visitors. But we try to make sure that each good that we have here tells a bit of a story. The longer term plans for the hub 
involve developing some of the assets that sit around the building. So working with other stakeholders, we'd like to develop some of the services that are available, for example, in the car park. So an enhanced electric vehicle charging um, capability would be very useful. Um, we'd also be interested in developing a green park and ride to take visitors from the village up to Urquhart Castle. There are around half a million people visit the castle every year in non-Covid times. So. For any communities who are thinking about moving towards a project like this, we would encourage them very much to get in touch with some of the, the other stakeholders and the help that's out there. DTAS and Community Share Scotland are just two examples of some fantastic resources. There's no need for any community to reinvent the wheel. It's already been done, but just take your time to find out who all can help you look at all the um, resources out there and if you need any help for goodness sake come and ask the likes of Loch Ness Hub. So obviously they've achieved an awful lot at a particularly difficult time up there at the Loch Ness Hub but what if there were other communities out there who are thinking that looks like something that, that we could really benefit from. We've maybe got a building that we could um, take over or, or maybe just get together more generally to try and to spread those visitors around and get them to stay for longer. What are the first steps to, to doing that? Yeah, first steps is to find out um, what's already happening in your community. Um, almost every community across the Highlands and Islands, uh, there, there are already what we call anchor organisations. These might be development trusts or community companies that are already working to do really exciting things. And, and, and this sort of trend towards community-led, asset-based, often community-led social enterprise is really exciting. It's been gathering pace over the last decade. So that's the first thing is to, to, to find out what's already happening. Um, but next is, is to take some learning from what other communities are doing. You know, this, this sort of approach of, um, of looking at the strengths of the area, looking at what you have got and then making the most of that, building on strengths. It's been going on for 30 years. Um, sometimes it's really high profile stuff, uh, you know, places like, like, like Egg or Ascent buying their land. Other times it's a little bit more under the radar. It's a little bit more specialist. Really great example would be the Shetland Dark Skies Initiative. So there, 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 there's all sorts going on. So, um, you know, find out what else is happening. Definitely talk to Islands and Isles Enterprise. Um, definitely talk to organisations like uh, the uh, De Development Trusts Association for Scotland and, uh, you know, take learning from what's happening. Um, once that's sort of underway, then definitely talk to us. Um, we can uh, put you in touch with um, other communities that are just starting out. There are opportunities to help you develop your thinking, develop your plans, um, and, uh, and do so in a way which is not sort of directive, which is not going to tell you what you should be doing, but giving you the space to really work it out for yourself. Um, and, and, and that way, we, we ensure that it's actually what you want to do and not what somebody else is telling you that you should do, um, which I think is really important. Uh, but um, as I say, put, put your periscope up, have a look around, see what else is happening, take inspiration, um, understand a bit about the perspiration of what's involved, of course, but take inspiration from some of the amazing things that are happening right across the Highlands and Islands. Well, you talk there about perspiration, and, and of course, this isn't something that's going to necessarily be particularly easy or come quickly. What, how much time, um, what kind of a commitment are we talking about in terms of time? And, and also, what kind of expertise do you need to have within a group to be able to make a success of something like this? Yeah, in, in terms of time, you're quite right. These things don't happen overnight. Um, if public bodies are going to part with money and give it to communities, they really want to know that the communities have thought about it, that they've, they've talked um, you know, with their whole community, that they've produced a plan, that they've looked at ways in which it could be financed. They, know, they need to know it's going to be sustainable. Um, so that does take time. But actually, it's time well spent because you'll learn things as you're going along. You'll, you'll bring people on board with you. And that's what we want as much as possible. Um, it, you'll never get absolutely 100% of the community behind anything, but you want to be taking people with you. Um, a lot of these, especially these, these assets, uh, you know, like um, taking over a lighthouse or, or turning a vacant school into a museum or 
or, or getting hold of a, a plot of land and to turn it into an eco campsite. These are what we call forever projects. These are these are always going to be in community ownership. You know these these buildings or these sites. Um, and in many respects, what we're doing, you know, the current generation is securing these assets so that every future generation will be able to use them. You know, to generate the benefit. It does take time. You know, we are talking three to five years typically for a community to go to go from scratch to to even be thinking about doing something quite significant. Uh, but it's it's time well spent. And as I say, think about future generations. That, that's why we're doing these things. You know, we've um, we've come a long way in the Hands and Islands over the last thirty years. But it hasn't just happened overnight. It has taken a lot of a lot of time and effort, but also a lot of visionary people. Yeah, well, I think that's that's very much what we're we're doing just now. We've had all this time of reflection for the last eighteen months to really think about the future and think about how we want that to look. Um, and as you say, having those assets is really key. Can you give me some other examples of of communities who have done just that, taken over? For example, uh, the lighthouse at Ardnamurchan uh, is a, is a great example, and other other um, examples like that. Yeah, the, the Ardnamurchan lighthouse is there are several lighthouses in the Highlands that are. Islands and islands that are that are owned by communities, um, Cowsey in in Murray, uh, Shetland the Beenie Trust also own lighthouses. The lighthouses, as you know, are all automated now, so um, there's nobody kind of living there. That means that there are there's accommodation at the lighthouse. Lighthouses are always interesting places, aren't they? Yeah. Um, communities, as I say, they, they look at they look at their, their 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 individual place and they think, well, what have we got that's of interest? And if you happen to be in the most westerly point. Of the British mainland, and at Ardnamurchan, it's the only um, Egyptian-style lighthouse in Britain. Well, that's different, isn't it? But you know, every community's got something a little bit unique. Another great example would be the Kyle Ray to Glenelg ferry, which is really a, a kind of living museum. It's the last turntable ferry where where the cars drive on, and uh, one of the crew kind of spins round the deck. And uh, you sort of drive off this, you know, the, the same side of the boat that you drove on, but it's a, it's a, it's, it's a way of uh, of going to going to, uh, to sky, you know, by sea. So you want to go over the sea to sky. You can do it in a living museum. But over in the Western Isles at Garanan, there's uh, the Black House Village, and that's been there for many years. The, the opportunity to stay in a genuine Black House that was. It was lived in until the 1970s, but it's been fully modernised, really comfortable. But especially when you pull up at night and the place is illuminated, it's just the most amazing experience. Um, so, you know, all of these things are owned by the community. They're run by the community. And of course, as a visitor, when you when you go there, you know that you're supporting the community. You also know that your, your kind of visitor spend is enabling the community, you know, to, to live um, in, in the way that they want to live. You're, you're, you're supporting the very thing that you, you're going there to visit. Braemar Castle is a brilliant example as well, um, just outside the Highlands and Highlands Enterprise area, but Braemar Castle, imagine that, a community that's got a, a long-term, I think it's a 25-year lease of a castle and runs a castle as a visitor attraction. You know, absolutely anything is possible, and that's the beauty of it. You never quite know what you're going to come across. Um, but, you know, they're all inspirational in their own way. Absolutely. And taking on a castle does sound a little daunting, but of course it doesn't need to be anything of that scale. What kind of, the, the people who've, who've managed to start these projects up, do they tend to be spearheaded by um, somebody who's got more experience or, or is it something that really anyone can do with the, because the support is, is out there? Anyone can get involved. It takes all sorts of skills to run um, a community-led social enterprise, just the same as any other business. You know, you, you need people who have got finance skills and you need people who've got communication skills and you need people who have got great written English and you need people who have got, who are quite visionary and, and, and all the rest of it. So in truth, you know, it needs all sorts of people. These organisations are always very, very keen to hear from, from other folks who can get involved and, 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 and you know, share the work around. It's the old saying about you know the, the more more hands make light work and um it, you know people are scarce in some communities um so every individual it's really important that everyone contributes i think noida is a great example of that you know there are fewer than 100 people 
live on the peninsula, but you've got four or five social enterprises doing different things, including r- running visitor accommodation. It's a, it's a fantastic example of how the jobs are, are kind of shared around and, and everybody's skills are valued and utilised. Um, so, uh, you know, th- there's always an opportunity to get involved. It, it is inspiring stuff to hear about all of these different ventures and uh, and exciting. It makes me want to go and visit <laughs> all of them. Um, but what what's the first, the very first step in terms of, I, I imagine it's a case of getting people together in a room to, to start thinking about what it is they want to achieve as community. What's the best way to do that? Is it literally, you know, emailing around town hall? What What's the best way to, to get people together in the first instance? You know, there's opportunity to pull in support from third sector interfaces in particular. Every uh, every community is represented by what's known as a TSI. And these are organisations whose role is to support community action like this. Um, they can often come along and facilitate a conversation uh, so that everyone's voice is heard. Um, once, you know, ideas start circulating, then it's it's possible to, to get support from all sorts of different organisations to have those ideas put into some sort of a plan and, you know, put it out to wider consultation. It's really about getting a conversation going. And yeah, you're right, in the old days, it would have been a circle of chairs in the village hall. It might just as easily be a, a kind of uh, village Facebook group or something like that these days. However you do it is absolutely fine, but it's really important that everyone has the chance to have their say and actually that you're able to evidence that so that when you go to uh, you, you might go to the lottery or some other source for funding. You're able to demonstrate that it's not just an, you know, your idea or a, or, or a handful of folks. It's actually the whole community that, uh, that have had their say and, and are pretty much behind this. So, you know, the short answer is get the conversations going. Mm-hmm. Now you mentioned the TSIs there. What, how can people find out more about, about that, about getting their involvement? Yeah, so just Google uh, third sector interface and the name of your of, of your local authority. So uh, Highland TSI or Murray TSI or whatever, whatever it might be. They're a great uh, a great way to get started. A great, you know, if you're looking for support, maybe constituting a, a, a new organisation, a new social enterprise, then that's a, a brilliant way to get started. Um, and and you know, once you're up and running, once you're constituted, then there's all sorts of, you know, it's a very complex, what we call ecosystem. It's kind of very, very complex support ecosystem. There are lots of, lots of organizations out there who can help you. Sometimes it can be difficult finding the right one. But, um, you know, as soon as you get started, you start talking to people, you'll find that we're all pretty well connected. And, uh, we'll, you know, there will be lots of signposting that happens to make sure that you put in touch with just the right person. Um, and it is, it's a bit of an adventure and you never quite know where it's going to lead you. Um, but in that sense, it's no different to any other enterprise or any, any other business. You know, you start a business, you never quite know where it's going to go, do you? You never quite know what's going to be the big income generators or, or which products are going to attract attention or which partnerships you're going to form. So I think as much as, 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 much as thinking of it as a kind of, you know, inverted commerce community project, think of it as an enterprise. Uh, an enterprise that you, you don't quite know what the end point of the journey is going to be, but, um, um, you know, leave it open to, to explore all the options and, and see where it takes you. And uh, if businesses do get in touch with you, what sort of support can you uh, give them in this, uh, in this endeavour? Our role is to, is to uh, provide learning opportunities, really, is to enhance their, their leadership and enterprise skills. So that's things like developing a a growth mindset, an enterprising mindset. Um, it's about developing uh, business plans. It's about being able to monitor and, and evaluate the impact. Um, it's uh, it's about ensuring that uh, th- these enterprises are well led, um, that they're able to, to to communicate, evidence their impact. Um, so the, the the skills that that, that we're enabling are transferable skills. You know, we, what we do is not to tell, uh, teach, or, or, or instruct. It's not about lecturing anybody. It's about building capacities within communities, um, you know, transferable skills that even if your current idea doesn't work out the way you intended it to, you'll use those skills and you'll take it forward and you, you'll use it in the next um, initiative that you get involved in, you know, however long down the line that is. Um, 
all of our uh, all of our facilitators are all social entrepreneurs themselves. They've all got the T-shirt. Um, so it's it's not that kind of theoretical or, or technical, you know, training that goes on. It's very practical support. And and actually, what happens in our learning programs is you you have people from all different communities who come together, and the learning that they share with each other is just as important, probably more important than the learning that happens to be led by the facilitator. And and actually, I think that's that's one of the strengths, one of the and, and one of the really kind of uh, I suppose heartwarming and, and and exciting elements of community-led social enterprise is that we're not competing with each other as communities. Actually, we're looking to work together. We, every community wants the community down the road uh, or on the neighbouring island to succeed because actually they're going to bring more visitors to the area. We're not competing with each other. We're, we're looking to collaborate with each other to create a world-class visitor product you know, that, that is going to compete against, um, uh, against destinations on the other side of the world. So, yeah, that, that opportunity to work together with other communities is um is 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 really rewarding um and, and and really enjoyable as well third sector interfaces are a great starting point um but once you're up and running i, I would recommend the work of development trust association scotland they can put you in touch with other enterprising communities that are, that are doing different things probably on the other side of scotland but there'll be someone who's who's doing something or trying to do something similar to yourself if it's a more on the on on the sort of business side of things then there's a, a single portal called Just Enterprise, uh, justenterprise.org, where you can access more directive business advice. Um, so I, th- I think together, those, those three sources of, of information and support, third sector interfaces, development trust association, and justenterprise.org, you know, are good places to start. Well, David, thank you so much for all of that. Loads of great information and advice there. And uh, as I say, inspiring stuff. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. Many thanks, Julia. It's a pleasure. Thanks for watching. And of course, you can get all the links mentioned in today's episode by visiting hie.co.uk forward slash Tinto. But for now, I've been Julia Sutherland. Thanks for watching.